all rice we have will avail the international criminal court is now in session lord john the court panel international at wait please be seated we have go as well Good afternoon, uh, court officer, please call the case. Thank you, Madam President. The situation in Uganda in the case of the prosecutor versus Dominique Ongwen. Case reference, ICC 0204-0115. For the record, we are in open session. I um, take it that the appearances uh, remain unchanged since our previous session today. Unless I hear to the contrary, no. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. Prosecution witnesses. Oh, thank you. Okay. As I see no indication, let's continue with the hearing. Earlier today, the appeal chamber delivered its judgment on the appeal of Mr. Ongwen against the conviction decision of the trial chamber. The appeal chamber unanimously rejected the appeal and confirmed that decision. We shall now turn to the other appeal of Mr. Ongwen, which is directed against the sentence imposed to him. Background. Pour rappel, les six mai, by way of background, on the 6th of May 2021, the trial chamber rendered the sentencing decision. It pronounced individual sentence for each of the 61 crimes of which Dominique Ongwe was convicted. The individual sentences ranged from 8 to 20 years of imprisonment. The trial chamber also pronounced by majority a joint sentence of 25 years of imprisonment. Deduced from this is the time that Mr. Ongwen spent in detention between the 4th of January 2015 and the pronouncement of the sentence. On 26 August 2021, the defense filled its appeal brief in which it raised 11 grounds of appeal. Although initially <coughs> in its notice of appeal, the defense has raised 12 grounds of appeal, it subsequently withdrew grounds of appeal nine. I shall now present the appeals chamber's findings on the grounds of appeal. First, actually translation of the confirmation decision, ground one. Under the first ground of appeal, the defense admits that the trial chamber violated the Mr. Ongwen's fair trial rights by issuing the sentencing decision before providing Mr. Ongwen with an actually translation of the conviction decision. The appeals chamber considers that generally when circumstances permit, translation of relevant parts of the conviction decision can be provided to be to the convicted person in course of the sentencing proceedings. However, as a matter of law, the right to receive a translation of a conviction decision under the statute and the rules is not in principle absolute for the purposes of sentencing as long as the convicted person, assisted by his or her counsel, is able to understand the conviction decision sufficiently for those purposes. 
The appeals chamber recalls in this respect that an accused person's right to translation under Article 67.1f of the statute and Rule 144 of the rules is circumscribed by the requirement of fairness. The appeals chamber is of the view that in, case, in the case at hand, Mr. Ongwen would have benefited from having an actual translation of at least parts of the conviction decision. However, for the reasons that follow, the appeals chamber does not find that the trial chamber erred in that and that proceedings were unfair as a result within the meaning of Article 83 of the statute. The appeals chamber notes that as part of the delivery of the conviction decision, Mr. Ongwen received the interpretation into a choli of the verdict and of an extensive summary of the main findings, findings and underlying reasons. In addition, the defense was put on notice of the potential aggravating factors and was able to make submissions and introduce evidence in relation to potential mitigating and aggravating circumstances. The appeals chamber, therefore, rejects the first ground of appeal. Testimonial evidence from victims, ground two. Under the second ground of appeal, the defense submits that the trial chamber erred in admitting and using in the sentencing decision testimonial evidence submitted by the legal representatives of victims. The appeal chamber notes that the trial chamber's clarification, the appeal chamber notes the trial chamber's clarification that it is appropriate to refer directly to the submissions of the victims as an expression of their will and opinion. The appeals chamber finds no error in the trial chamber's conclusion. The appeals chamber finds that the defense has not demonstrated that the trial chamber erred in this respect uh, uh, and accordingly rejects the second ground of appeal. Acholi traditional justice system ground three. Under the third ground of appeal, the defense submits that the trial chamber erred when it rejected and failed to objectively consider, in this case, the Acholi traditional justice system, in particular, the Acholi ritual of Mato Oput. In considering the defense's submissions on this issue, the trial chamber noted that Article 23 of the statute provides that a person convicted by the court may be punished only in accordance with the statute. It also took note of Article 77 of the statute, which stipulates exhaustively the penalties to be imposed for the commission of crimes within the jurisdiction of the court. In light of these provisions, the trial chamber found that any defense submissions to incorporate traditional justice mechanism into the sentence imposed on the convicted person must fail directly as a result of the principle of nulla pena sine legge. The appeals chamber notes that the trial chamber correctly found that it was precluded from incorporating a penalty not foreseen in the legal framework of the statute. The defense also challenges the trial chamber's alleged failure to apply the principle of complementarity to the actually traditional justice system. While respect to, respectful of the cultural beliefs advanced by the defense and mindful of their significance, the appeals chamber considers that the question of the incorporation of the actually traditional judicial system into the court's statutory framework has no bearing on complementarity 
or admissibility matters. The defense further contends that the trial chamber held a biased view of the actually traditional justice system because it relied on the testimony of non actually persons and refused to hear witnesses who the defense submits were well placed to inform conclusions on that justice system. It also submits that the trial chamber disregarded its submissions on social rehabilitation and reintegration and failed to appreciate correctly the relevant cultural beliefs and practices of Mr. Ongwen as a personal circumstance. The appeals chamber finds no merit on, in these submissions. For the reasons that were just outlined and for other reasons set out in the judgment, the appeals chamber rejects the third ground of appeal. Cumulative sentencing, ground four. Under the fourth ground of appeal, the defense argues that the trial chamber erred in sentencing Mr. Ongwen for both war crimes and crimes against humanity based on the same underlying conduct. The appeals chamber notes that the trial chamber was aware of the factual overlap and the need to take into account in the determination of the joint sentence. The defense does not point to any finding of the trial chamber that would suggest the contrary. The appeals chamber finds no error in the trial chamber's approach and therefore rejects this ground of appeal. Factors outside the temporal scope, ground five. Under the fifth ground of appeal, the defense submits that the trial chamber erred in law by relying on events as aggravating circumstances that took place outside of the temporal scope of the charges. The appeals chamber notes that while in sentencing decision, the trial chamber noted certain events that occurred outside of the temporal scope of the charges, it did not consider crimes allegedly committed prior to the temporal scope of the charges as aggravating circumstances. Regarding the births of children fathered by Mr. Ongwen, the appeals chamber notes that the trial chamber took into consideration births that occurred after the time period relevant to the charges. The appeals chamber recalls in this respect the, that conduct after the crime may inform the assessment of the gravity of the crime or give rise to an aggravating circumstance, as long as there is sufficiently proximate link between the conduct and the crimes. The appeal chamber thus rejects the fifth ground of appeal. Family circumstances, ground six. Under the sixth ground of appeal, the defense submits that the trial chamber erred in rejecting <coughs> the mitigating factor and personal circumstance of Mr. Ongwen's family life. The appeals chamber is satisfied that the trial chamber correctly weighed Mr. Ongwen's fatherhood against the factors calling into question the genuine nature of his motivation to take care of his children. The defense does not demonstrate any error in this respect. The appeals chamber therefore rejects the defense's sixth ground of appeal. Mental capacity, ground seven and 10. As the subject matter of grounds of appeal seven and 10 are related, the appeal chambers will address them together. 
Under the seventh round of appeal, the defense raises two issues regarding Mr. Onwin's mental state. Firstly, the defense submits that the trial chamber erred when it found that Mr. Onwen did not suffer from a substantially diminished mental capacity at the time of the crimes. Secondly, the defense argues that the trial chamber erred in finding that Mr. Onwen's current mental health could not be taken into account as a personal circumstance. The appeals chamber notes when determining the sentencing and after having concluded that the ground for exclusion of, of criminal responsibility under Article 31.1a of the statute is not made out, made out, a trial chamber, if it relies on the same evidence upon which it relied for its findings under Article 31.1a, must determine, determine whether the same evidence may be sufficient to meet the threshold of Rule 1452A I of the rules. The defense challenges inter alia the trial chamber's reliance on the evidence of the, pro of the prosecutor, prosecution experts. The appeals chamber notes that in the conviction decision, the trial chamber considered the expert's evidence related to Mr. Ongwen's abduction and possible disorders. The trial chamber also considered the expert's evidence that it was highly unlikely that Mr. Ongwen's level of functioning was severely impaired. The appeals chamber finds that the unambiguous findings of those experts do not support the proposition that Mr. Ongwen suffered from substantially diminished mental capacity. It was therefore not unreasonable for the trial chamber to conclude under the standard of a balance of probabilities that the results of the analysis of the possibility of a mental disease or defect were incompatible with any consideration of substantially diminished mental capacity. The defense also challenges the trial chamber's rejection of Mr. Ongwen's current mental state as a mitigating factor. The trial chamber set out the standard of exceptional cases for accepting poor health as a mitigating factor. It considered the defense's submissions on this issue and concluded that Mr. Ongwen's current mental health could not be taken into account as a mitigating circumstance. The appeals chamber notes that the defense does not expressly argue nor is it readily apparent from the quoted sources recording Mr. Ongwen's condition that his alleged disabilities are such as to constitute an exceptional case. Within the meaning adopted by the trial chamber, within the meaning adopted by the trial chamber. Under the 10th ground of appeal, the defense admits that the trial chamber erred by using Mr. Ongwen's unsworn statement, which he made out in court against him. In the sentencing decision, the trial chamber referred to its own impressions of Mr. Ongwen's personal <coughs> statement in court to conclude that his current mental health would not be taken into account as a mitigating circumstance. The appeals chamber notes that a trial chamber has broad discretion in determining what constitutes a mitigating factor and the weight, if any, to attribute to it. A trial chamber may, for instance, rely on the person's conduct during the trial proceedings 
ascertained primarily through the trial judge's perception of that person. The appeals chamber is of the view that the trial chamber's reliance on its impressions on Mr. Owen's personal statement was permissible. For the reasons for these reasons, the appeals chamber rejects the seventh and the tenth ground of appeal. Duress, ground eight. Under the eighth ground of appeal, the defense admits that the trial chamber erred by disregarding evidence in its assessment of whether Mr. Ongwen met the threshold of duress as a circumstance falling short of constituting a ground for exclusion of criminal responsibility. The trial chamber found that duress is not applicable in the present case as a mitigating circumstance pursuant Rule 1452AI of the rules. The Appeals Chamber has already considered and rejected in its conviction appeal judgment arguments raised by the defense in relation to the trial chamber's conclusion that duress was not applicable as a ground for excluding criminal responsibility. The Appeals Chamber notes in this regard that in arguing that relevant evidence was ignored or disregarded, the defense appears to raise identical issues in its sentencing appeal brief. The Appeals Chamber rejects this ground of appeal. Aggravating Circumstances, Ground 11. Under the 11th ground of appeal, the defense submits that the trial chamber impermissibly relied on the accumulation of aggravating factors when calculating a joint sentence pursuant Article 78.3 of the statute, and abused its discretion in imposing a joint sentence that was without justifiable legal and evidentiary basis. Contrary to the defense's suggestion, the trial chamber articulated in a clear manner the relevant considerations that informed its exercise of discretion when imposing the joint sentence of 25 years of imprisonment. The defense incorrectly submits that the trial chamber relied on criteria of a very large extent of cumulative victimization and the extent of accumulation of the individual sentences. The trial chamber weighed several relevant considerations, but did not impose any criteria in terms suggested by the defense. The appeal chamber thus rejects the defense's 11th ground of appeal. Under the 12th ground of appeal, the defense submits that the trial chamber erred by violating the prohibition against counting the same factor twice in sentencing. For the reasons set out in the sentencing judgment, the appeals chamber finds no merit in the arguments raised by the defense in relation to the alleged double counting of the following factors. First, discriminatory intent as a factor of the gravity of the crimes and as aggravating factor. Two, the defenselessness of children recruited into LRA as an aggravating factor. And three, essential elements of the modes of liability as aggravating factor. Regarding the alleged double counting of the factor concerning the high number of victims, the appeals chamber by majority, Judge Ivanez dissenting, concurs with the prosecutor that the trial chamber's reference to the number of victims, both 
in the context of discussing the gravity of the crimes and to establish the aggravating circumstance of multiplicity of victims was uh, rather ambiguous. In this regard, although the trial chamber may not have been sufficiently careful in its discussion of this factor, the appeals chamber, by majority, Judge <coughs> Ibanez dissenting, understands that it did not rely upon it twice. I shall explain in more detail shortly. I disagree with the majority on this last point, noting the trial chamber's reasoning. I am of the view that the trial chamber took into account an attached way to the factor of multiplicity of victims twice, and therefore committed an error of law that materially affected the individual sentences for 20 counts, and consequently, the joint sentence. For these reasons, the majority of the Appeals Chamber, Judge Ibanez Carranza dissenting, rejects the 12th ground of appeal. Partially dissenting opinion of Judge Ibanez Carranza. As just mentioned, I am unable to agree with the majority on the issue of double counting the factor of the high number of victims, which raises a serious issue as regards the reasoning of the trial chamber and which materially affects 20 out of the 61 crimes, and thus almost one third of the individual sentence imposed. In particular, the individual sentences for the following crimes are affected, the crimes of murder and attempt murder counts 2, 3, 12, 13, 14, 15, 25, 26, 27, 28, 38, 39, and 40, 41. Torture counts 4, 5. And enslavement count 8, 20, 33, and 46. As a consequence, this error materially affects the joint sentence of 25 years in my view, this issue cannot be overlooked because it has an impact in the fairness of the sentencing proceedings, causing prejudice to the convicted person. Indeed, the rationale behind the prohibition of double counting is to prevent a convicted person from being punished twice in relation to the same factor. In cases such as this one, where the number of victims may have been relevant both to the gravity assessment and as aggravating circumstance, the sentencing decision should have clearly stated in its reasoning whether weight was given to this factor as part of gravity assessment or as aggravating circumstance. Since this was not done, the trial chamber, trial chamber failed to ensure coherence, consistency, and certainty in its reasoning. And the only reasonable conclusion is that in relation to 20 counts, the trial chamber has given weight to the number of victims twice in contravention of the prohibition of double counting, thus affecting fairness. I also wish to use this opportunity to stress the importance of the personal situation of Dominique Ogwen from the point of view of the sentencing. As far as this is concerned, we should remember that is the first time that the court is called upon to address the unique issues of victim perpetrator and its relevance to the determination 
of sentence. I also wish to use this opportunity to emphasize the importance of Mr. Ongwen's particular individual circumstances in mitigation. In this regard, it is significant that this is the first time that the court is called upon to address the unique issue of victim perpetrator and its relevance to the determination of the sentence. It must be pointed out that in circumstances of this case, the status of victim perpetrator is not a consideration relevant to a determination of an accused person's guilt or innocence pursuant Article 74 of the statute. Rather, these matters inform the appropriate sentence to be imposed in case of a conviction under Article 76 of the statute. At this stage, the appropriate sentence is not only informed by the facts of the case, but also, and importantly, by the personal circumstances of the convicted person. In particular, in this case, it is of crucial importance to consider the impact that Mr. Ongwen's abduction, conscription, violent indoctrination, being forced to carry out and participate in criminal acts when he was still a defenseless child of about nine years old of age, and his upbringing in the coercive environment of the LRA had on his personality, the development of his brain and moral values and future opportunities. A determination of appropriate sentence requires thus a holistic analysis that takes into consideration both the blameworthiness of the convicted person and his or her individual circumstances. Mr. Ongwen's condition as a victim did not cease when he turned 18 years old. For the reasons fully developed in my partly dissenting opinion, I am of the view that the significant legal error of double counting had a material impact on 20 of the 61 individual sentences concerned thus almost one third, <coughs> affecting the fairness of the sentencing proceedings and ultimately <coughs> leading to an incorrect exercise of discretion by the trial <coughs> chamber as a consequence of which the trial chamber imposed a disproportionate joint sentence of 25 years of imprisonment. <laughs> Therefore, I am of the view that the joint sentence must be reversed and the matter remanded to the trial chamber for it to determine a new sentence. In its new determination, the trial chamber should also consider the weight that ought to be afforded in mitigation of Mr. Ongwen's personal circumstances. In particular, the impact that the traumatic experiences which he underwent had on his personality, as explained earlier. I further considered that given the expressive nature of judicial decisions, and specifically of international criminal judgments, recognizing in this case the crimes of which Mr. Ongwen was a victim provides the means to acknowledge his victim status and reinstate the dignity that was taken away from him when he was only a defenseless child. In determining a new sentence, the object and purpose of sentencing ought to be considered. In this regard, I firmly believe that in the context of international criminal law, sentencing serves various purposes, including notably retribution and prevention in all its variants, special and general. 
in relation to the general preventive purpose, all its aspects ought to be considered. And because of the nature and the context of the crimes, in particular, the positive aspect of general prevention is of relevance. This includes, according to the jurisprudence of the court and other international tribunals, and as illustrated in the recent developments, developments before the Assembly of States parties, contributions to the promotion of restorative justice and reconciliation as a way to advance the enforcement of the rule of law and therefore sustainable peace. While I consider that the error of double counting should certainly result in an appropriate reduction of the joint sentence of 25 years of imprisonment, I am of the view that the trial chamber would be better placed to determine the appropriate sentence, taking into account the findings made in this partially dissenting opinion. Importantly, I would also like to emphasize that nothing in my partly dissenting opinion should be interpreted as negating the great suffering of the victims of the very serious crimes of Mr. Uh, which Mr. Nguyen has been convicted. In particular, that suffered by victims of sexual and gender-based crimes and the victimized children. This suffering has been duly and unanimously acknowledged in the conviction decision and sentencing decision as confirmed by the Appeals Chamber in today's judgments. I also wish to point out that I am convinced that Mr. Ongwen must be sentenced for the crimes which he committed. I am of the view that, the only, that only through the imposition of an adequate proportionate and fair sentence will justice for both victims and the convicted person be achieved. Appropriate relief. The Appeals Chamber has unanimously rejected 10 of the 11 grounds of appeal in sentencing, on sentencing. It confirms these aspects of the sentencing decision. Regarding ground of appeal 12, the appeals chamber rejects it by majority, and as just discussed, I partly dissent only with respect to the allegation of double counting of the factor of multiplicity of victims. While the majority confirms the sentencing decision in this respect, I would reverse the joint sentence of 25 years of imprisonment and remand the matter to the trial chamber for it to determine a new sentence. Conclusion. This brings us to the end of the summary of the Appeals, chamber, appeals Chamber's judgment. As mentioned this morning, the judgments will be notified to the parties and participants shortly after this hearing. Summaries of the judgments will be also available, both in English and in French. A Spanish version of the summary of the two judgments will be available in due course. I would like to thank first the interpreters for his invaluable contribution and all the registry staff who assisted in this hearing. The hearing is now adjourned. All rise, we will.